Thanks, Carly. Good morning. Somebody in the front row said, good morning, sir. I, 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 <laughs> reminds me of the time I was walking across Biola's campus, and uh, it was first time my daughter was at Biola, my oldest daughter. And she's a freshman. It's first week of school, and we're walking to lunch together. It was a wonderful moment. And somebody, one of my students walks by and says, hi, Dr. Hellerman. And Rebecca says, what did he call you? <laughs> so uh, anyway, well, as we... You know, as I look back over the, you know, my 20 plus years at OCF, uh, 20, uh, going on 23 now, I have, I associate certain years with, with certain milestones. I came here in 1996, you know, that was a milestone for me. We hired Brandon in 98, I think, that was a milestone for our church. We lost our founding pastor in 2000, another milestone, 2000, what was it, 2006 we moved into this building, uh, another milestone. I think when I look back on 2018, uh, the milestone is going to be, oh, that was the year you all had babies. <laughs> I mean, it's been one after another, which is awesome. This, this couple here on the screen earlier, they're in our, our Bible study. And that, uh, that uh, older uh, daughter, Tegan, the four-year-old, she is uh, really, really precocious. She's, 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 uh, she's in for some surprises with younger <laughs> brother. <laughs> but it's wonderful, just wonderful to fellowship with these young couples on Saturdays. Um, you know, Joanne and I, reflecting back the other day on uh, when, uh, when we had our kids. And I said to Joanne, I go, yeah, did, were there even any, you know, like over-the-counter pregnancy tests back in the dark ages when we had our kids? And, <laughs> and she says, oh, yeah, yeah, there were. And she says, but, but I just knew, you know, a woman who's in touch with her body just knows, you know. And so we started talking. I said, yeah, you, you just knew, but there's, there's something about, you know, an outside input. You know, so you look at that, take that pregnancy test, and it's a little more official. And then when you go to the doctor and you hear the announcement, you're pregnant from the official doctor, then all of a sudden it becomes very real. Now, uh, today we have even a more uh, profound announcement. We have a young woman uh, hearing that she's pregnant from an angel. Now, that is a whole, uh, whole nother level here. And so we're going to be uh, looking at the uh, Annunciation today. The text is up on the outline. I'll encourage you to turn there in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible under the seats in front of you. It's page 855. Uh, but uh, we're going to jump into this passage. And I was talking to Denny O'Keefe on the way in about preaching a passage that is so familiar. I mean, this passage is something every one of us has, uh, has heard every year since we could almost uh, hear the Bible uh, read, and yet it is new every morning. That's the, the beauty of God's Word, isn't it? And so uh, we'll just uh, ask Holy Spirit, we invite you to, uh, to take over this morning and open our eyes as we look to see Jesus maybe in a new way. Okay, I'm just going to start reading there, verse 26 of... Luke chapter 1, uh, our theme uh, on, uh, with Advent is peace, but because we're sticking to the text in Luke, we won't be touching on the peace theme so much. I may come back to it at the end of the service, but I think we'll find some uh, good stuff to think about and reflect on here this morning. So follow along as I read a very familiar passage. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. You've got an outline with a few blanks to fill in. The first one, uh, which is really the overarching theme of this passage, is that God comes through, folks. God comes through. Uh, we were, I was having a discussion with uh, Brandon and another fellow, I ride back and forth, the three of us ride back and forth to Biola together, and uh, on how, how do you define the word religion? 
And we, you know, we're going back and forth and this and that. But uh, this other fellow went through the same program I did uh, at UCLA. And our advisor had a real interesting definition of religion. Uh, and, and it really stuck with me. And that is, he basically said, you know, human beings from the get-go all over the world look around and realize that something has gone wrong. Whether we look at the macro level of nation states fighting with each other, people killing each other off in warfare, uh, generation after generation, or we look at the, uh, the personal level of our own lives, our relationships, our health, we look at natural disasters, we look at the way the world is, and we get the sense as human beings that things are just not quite right, and in some cases, very, very wrong. And the message of the Bible is that uh, that is on us, that we as a human race have rebelled against God, turned our back on God, and that affects not just our personal lives, but all of the reality we live in, even down to the uh, created order. But the good news of the Bible is that God, from the moment we turned our backs on him, has been determined to bring us back home and fix the mess that we've made of the life he's given us. And as we think through the story of scripture, God hasn't done much fixing. There has been a lot of silence between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. But when we get here to Luke chapter one, we are reminded once again that God never gives up and God comes through. I just wanna highlight for you some uh, pieces of the passage I just read. Look at the all these future verbs. You will conceive. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, will be called the son of the most high. The Lord will give him the throne of David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. You get the impression that God is determined to fix the mess that we've made of the life he's given us? God will not give up on us, will he? And Christmas is one of the greatest uh, expressions of that reality. Now we'll spend a good bit more time on the next points on your outline. When God comes here in the incarnation, God comes in power in a very, very special way. Notice how Mary responds there in verse 34 to the what we call the Annunciation by Gabriel. She says to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy. Now, we always like to say, you always want to ask what the therefore is therefore when it's in the Bible. And we're going to come back to that. But notice the text goes on. Uh, the angel says, behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. You know, if you want some takeaway from the sermon, how about that statement, you know? Just grab it and run with it and live as if it's true, and life will never be the same. Now, we're going to return to Mary and her reaction below. But here I want to focus a bit on Jesus and the miracle of the virgin birth. The text says basically that the God who brought life out of nothing and created humans from the dust at the beginning is able to create human life in a virgin's womb. Now, the key verse here is verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And we're going to dig into this verse in some detail. But before we do, I just want to highlight a beautiful image here, this idea of uh, the, the Most High overshadowing Mary. This is the same word that was used in the Old Testament when the, uh, the Jews translated the Old Testament into the same language as the New Testament into Greek. This, was the, this overshadow word was used for the Shekinah glory overshadowing the tabernacle. Notice, the cloud covered the tent of meeting. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. That's the same word. The cloud overshadowed it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So you've got 
all this biblical imagery here, this beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit of God uh, kind of tabernacling, over, overshadowing Mary here. But then the therefore. Therefore, the child to be born would be called, the, or be called holy, the Son of God. This therefore makes an explicit connection between the work of the Holy Spirit in the virginal conception on the one hand and the character or nature of Jesus on the other. Uh, there's some sense in which Jesus will be the Holy Son of God because the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary. And this has led over the years to a whole lot of reflection and speculation about the relationship of uh, the virginal conception, what we call loosely the virgin birth, and the nature of Jesus as the Holy Son of God. And uh, the, uh, the reflection goes something like this, that the idea that Jesus is sinless uh, or holy, uh, what this means is that Jesus is sinless, okay? What this means is that Jesus is sinless, or so the argument goes. And the connection works like this. The creative involvement of the Holy Spirit in the virginal conception somehow preserved Jesus from inheriting original sin. Now, we know Jesus did not commit personal sin, but what about the doctrine of original sin? What about the fact that we all inherit corruption from Adam? How is Jesus preserved from that? Well, the argument goes that because of the involvement of the Holy Spirit in his conception, he was preserved from original sin. Now, theologians really don't know how they can't that happen because, after all, he's the product of a human mother. And the Bible doesn't teach anywhere that our sin nature only comes through the male line. But we do know Jesus is sinless, and we do know the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, and we have a therefore there. So we figure somehow the involvement of God in the conception of Jesus preserved him from original sin. And it seemed, that seems to make sense. And you'll find these arguments in Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, the one we pass out to all our new members. The second part of this argument goes like this, that uh, Son of God refers to Jesus' deity, refers to Jesus' deity, that he's divine. So here's how this connection works, okay? Jesus, uh, this relates to what we call two-nature Christology, the, the orthodox teaching of the Bible, as articulated by later church councils, that Jesus is both fully man and fully God, two natures, one person. And so the connection with the virgin birth is, aha, Jesus is fully God, the Holy Spirit's involvement with his conception, and he's fully man, he has a human mother. The argument being that if he had a human father and a human mother, we'd have trouble seeing how, that he, how he was divine, how he was God incarnate. But if, G, if God just created a human being in heaven and kind of sent him down here, Without Mary as a human mother, then we'd wonder how he could be like us since he wasn't, you know, uh, didn't, wasn't born kind of like us. So, aha, see, the virginal conception then is connected to the deity and humanity of Christ. Now, so we have here the Holy Spirit's involvement, therefore Jesus is the perfect God-man. Now, there may be some truth to this uh, theological speculation, and it's all over the theology books, and it does seem to make some sense, doesn't it? But interestingly enough, this is not what Luke's argument in the text is about at all. And uh, this is a great object lesson, because it's really important for us to stay close to the text and see what the text says before we begin to try to make connections and figure out things ourselves. And so as this, as it turns out, and this is a this is really important. This passage today is not about what Jesus is like. It's not about his sinlessness or his divinity, although Luke believed in both of those, and the New Testament teaches both of those. But this passage is not about what Jesus is like. It's about what Jesus came to do. And I want to revisit these expressions with you and suggest that here, holy does not mean sinless. Holy means set apart for special service, which is the basic meaning of the word to begin with. Sinless is kind of a subset of holy. God is 
other. God is holy. A part of that is God is, Jesus is sinless. But here, to give you an idea of how this root word is often used, the same, holy is an adjective, and we're going to see the noun and the verb used in another passage here, clearly referring not to sinlessness, but the idea of set apart for special service. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. If you know anything about the church at Corinth, they were a moral mess. They were not living life for Jesus in the way his kids are supposed to. And so Paul starts the letter by writing to the church of God in Corinth to those that are sanctified, same root, set aside as holy, called to be saints, same root, called to be holy. Paul's whole point here is, look, you guys can't live like this when God has designed you, set you apart as special to serve him. Clearly doesn't refer to their sinlessness. It refers to being set apart for service. Secondly, I'd like to suggest this morning that the Son of God terminology is not here a reference to Jesus' divinity, to his deity. When you hear the phrase Son of God, you and I often think, oh, Son of God is Jesus' deity, Son of Man is, is humanity, and that's not quite right. When a first century Jew heard the phrase Son of God, it took him all the way back to 2 Samuel 7, where a promise was given to David regarding his descendants. The promise reads like this, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a what? A son, and this is the immediate promise regarding Solomon, but of course it looks forward to the Davidic Messiah. And so when we hear Son of God expressions here, again, we're not dealing with what Jesus is like, his ontology, if you will. We're dealing with the reminder that Jesus is the promised Davidic Messiah, see? And this is as clear as a bell back in those verses we looked at before. Notice what Luke's agenda here is. Son of the Most High. There's that sonship language again that brings 2 Samuel 7 to, to our remembrance. Throne of his father David, reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. One author writes, he says, the fundament, or the kingdom rule of the promised Davidic son is a fundamental concept in Luke's theology. Earlier we talked about the four Gospels having different emphases. We might say in parallel, the deity of Christ is a fundamental concept in the Gospel of John's theology. But here, the focus is on what Jesus came to earth to do, namely reign as the promised Davidic Messiah, not what he came to earth to be, the perfect, sinless God-man. For those of you who like fancy words, Luke is concerned with functional Christology, what Jesus came to do, not ontological Christology, the deity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, this kind of stuff. As one writer put it like this, he said, the emphasis of the passage is not on the manner of Jesus' birth, though it is clearly a virginal conception. The focus is on God's gracious work in fulfilling the promise to deliver his people. Folks, the good news of this passage is that God never gives up. God never gives up. God comes through, and God is working in history and will continue and work, will work in history to fix the mess we've made of this world the mess we've made of our individual lives. God is determined, determined to redeem. Now, we're going to make a turn here and uh, get a bit, uh, a bit more practical and try to ask our question as we move the focus from Jesus to Mary. We're going to ask the question, okay, what kind of person, what kind of people does God use to fulfill his plan. Because here at the, at the crescendo of God's great plan in salvation history to set the world straight, Mary is chosen to bear God's Messiah. 
And we have an opportunity as we come to this text not only to see God's great plan unfolding before our eyes, but to ask ourselves the question, what kind of person does God use as he is telling his story to the world? And it turns out uh, that person is Mary. Notice uh, point three on your outline, God comes from below. And we'll see what this means in a minute. We read this in verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So what kind of a person does God use as a key player in his great story to fulfill his promise to fix the mess we've made of the life he's given us? He uses folks, a nobody. He uses Mary. He uses a nobody. Now, if you come from a Roman Catholic background, that uh, probably has created a little bit of cognitive dissonance for you when I said he uses a nobody. But I want you to see what Luke is up to here. There's an interesting phenomenon in this passage. As the story goes from the birth of John to the birth of Jesus, of course, we move from the lesser to the greater, from the forerunner, the prophet who's preparing the way to the Messiah. But as the parallel story runs from Zechariah, who receives the annunciation from Gabriel about the birth of John the Baptist, to Mary, instead of going from the lesser to greater, we go from the greater to the lesser. Look what happens here. Zechariah, back in the previous passage that Brandon preached on last week. Zechariah, the announcement was made in the big city, Jerusalem. It was made in this massive temple that was one of the wonders of the world. You remember the disciples in, in the gospel saying to Jesus, oh, look how great these stones are. This, the temple was uh, uh, amazing. Uh, these ancient Jewish writers talk about it astounding the eye from afar, all this kind of stuff. The announcement to Zechariah about John the Baptist was made to a priest. And boy, uh, in a in a culture where bloodline and lineage is everything, to be a priest and have the blood of your forefather Aaron going through your blood made you somebody special. And of course, this was a culture where age was respected and males were privileged. Now look at Mary. Mary comes from a rural village named Nazareth. You know, the only time we read about Nazareth anywhere in ancient literature, Jewish rabbinic literature, intertestamental literature, Greco-Roman literature, is in the Bible. And remember what Nathaniel said to Philip when Philip said, we found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, can any good thing come of Nazareth? Nazareth was basically backwoods dirt, okay? Any of you guys heard of a town named Cudahy? Did you know Cudahy's in L.A. County? It's the second smallest town in L.A. County. There is a town called Cudahy. You never heard of it. Just a few of you. Val, you've heard of it? Well, it's funny because when I was doing college ministry, this kid comes to the end of the class and, hey, where do you live? In Cudahy. And I thought, you know, that was South Carolina or somewhere. Little did I know that's right out off the 605 down there next to Bell. Yeah, Cudahy. Well, Nazareth was the Cudahy of, uh, <laughs> of the ancient world, you know? It was, and then... Of course, instead of the angel showing up at this massive temple, the angel shows up in this little humble home in Nazareth to a person who has no bloodline. She's got David's bloodline, but that ain't like being a priest. She was so far removed from God. That, well, you know, Zechariah, he could walk right into the temple when he got called upon to light the incense. Mary couldn't even get into the court of the males. She had to stay in the court of women when she went down to the temple. Yeah. And then, of course, she's a teenage female. And you talk about a nobody in this culture. You take a woman who's a teenager, who's from a place like Nazareth, and you're basically dealing with a nobody. And so this is the picture here. Whether we think of geography, whether we think of status, God is using a nobody to do uh, uh, arguably, arguably the greatest miracle in the whole Bible is the incarnation. Everything starts and ends there and God uses a nobody to do his work. The interesting thing is, as you look at this list, uh, 
Zechariah uh, doubts. Remember Zechariah? He says to the angel, how shall I know this? Basically asking for a sign. One of our members, Tom Freitag, and I were out there at the store of the church last Sunday when the church is letting out, and Brandon had preached on this passage and talking about Zechariah looking for a sign. And, and, and Tom and I remarking, my goodness, he had an angel appear to him. He already had a sign. Hello, you know, how will I know this? And Mary doesn't ask for a sign. Mary just assumes it's going to happen and is curious, how will this be? I'm a virgin. How will this be? And what's so interesting is, do you know Zechariah, who's the doubter, had a biblical precedent for believing? God had taken barren women like Sarah, Hannah, and others and given them children in the Old Testament. So he had a biblical precedent to believe. Mary had no biblical precedent. Maybe a little hint back in Isaiah 7, but basically no virgin had ever conceived and given birth to a child in Jewish or world history at this point. And yet Mary is the one who responds positively. Now, uh, we're back to our question. What kind of people does God use to fulfill his promise to fix the mess we've made of the life he's given us? And that is very ordinary people like Mary, like you, and like me. This is the beautiful message here of this Christmas story. The challenge to us as human beings is we don't really like that. We say we do, but we don't really like that. We like to set up hierarchies where we see God using very special people to do his thing. So we have a phenomenon in our evangelical culture in America of churches getting bigger and bigger and bigger and fewer and fewer people doing the ministry so that it is very, very special people uh, on a video screen or in person to thousands of people delivering the gospel while the rest of us just kind of sit and listen and get reinforced the idea that God uses special people to unfold his plan, not me. And nothing could be further from the truth. But if there's ever an example in church history of how we turn things upside down, look what we've done with the message of our text today, namely that God used an ordinary teenage girl to bring the Messiah into the world. Our church tradition on the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary, over the century of church history, has been identified as the mother of God. And then the doctrine of the assumption to heaven. Did you know, according to this doctrine, Mary didn't die and was buried. She was just taken to heaven, body and soul, when she died. Because again, according to this understanding, she's a very special person, see? Not an ordinary person at all. You probably thought when you heard the phrase the Immaculate Conception, it referred to the virgin birth. Nope. In doc, Roman Catholic doctrine, it refers to Mary's birth, that she was conceived apart from sin. See, this protects Jesus from being, uh, having original sin, but it just moves the problem back a generation, obviously. And then finally, uh, this same... Uh, doctrine uh, asserts that Mary was always a virgin. The phrase is antepartum, partum, and postpartum. The idea that Mary was a virgin all the way through. She never had sex, and so these quote-unquote brothers of Jesus, half-brothers of Jesus we read about in the Bible are actually cousins or, or kids from Joseph's previous marriage or whatever it might be. Isn't it ironic that we've taken God's example of how he uses the ordinary, and we've totally turned it into Mary into the exceptional person that none of us can see as an example or emulate. And you look in the scriptures, and the biblical evidence teaches none of this, none of it. Well, one might argue that Mary is the mother of God, certainly, to the degree Jesus is God. And in some contexts in church history, that was the emphasis of the phrase, and that's fine. 
But I crossed it out because there's some real problematic stuff with this mother of God stuff that goes all the way back to 250 A.D. or so. Notice this prayer from early church tradition. We fly to thy, prote thy protection, O holy mother of God. Do not despise our petitions and our necessities, but deliver us always from all dangers, O glorious and blessed virgin. Amen. Look what the Bible says. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Any of you guys get up this morning and pray to Brandon Cash before you came to church? <laughs> Joe did. Yeah? <laughs> you know, you're not going to hurt yourself praying to Mary, but it ain't going to help you much either. Okay? Not if Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. So as we, uh, as we think about this great irony of, of the person who was to be the epitome of the ordinary, God using the ordinary in his greatest act in salvation history, we ask ourselves, where did all this come from? And there's a sense in which it begins right in the New Testament. Notice, Elizabeth says to Mary, blessed are you among women. Mary says, from now on, uh, all generations will call me blessed. And it's interesting, it wasn't long before people, the public began to pick up on this. So Jesus is out there teaching, and this lady stands up in the crowd and says, uh, raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. Okay? And now the ball started rolling, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger as church history unfolded. Now, but I want us to stop and reflect on what it means to be blessed by God. And here's the contrast. Put on your thinking caps and see if you can sort through this with me now, because this really drills down to the heart of this. Did God choose to use Mary because she was blessed? Or is Mary blessed because God chose to use her? Okay? Another way, you know, did God choose Mary because she was special or is Mary special because God used her? That's, this might sound like double talk, but this is crucial, folks. Here's another way to think about this. Does God use blessed people, special people, or does God bless faithful people? The reason this is so, so crucial because, it, because this, folks, drills down to the heart of the gospel itself. Does God love you and I because of some inherent goodness we have as human beings? Or does God make us good by his love for us? The problem in our culture is this silly self-esteem stuff that has permeated our educational system now for the better part of two generations has somehow convinced us as human beings that there is some intrinsic good in me that that, 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 that ought to make me feel good about myself and that other people ought to respect. And I remember I had this girlfriend, we were going back and forth with this question theologically, is there some inherent good in me? Is that God love me because I'm inherently good or am I good because God loves me? And she insisted, you know, no, God, God loves us because there, there's something that God just loves, loves about us. He, Inherently good. And finally, I kind of pinned her down. She took me back to Genesis 1. She says, we're created in the image of God, see? And I asked her, I said, the image of who? The image of who? So even that is utterly dependent on God and his work. And this is a crucial, crucial point. So does God use blessed people to get back to Mary, or does God bless faithful people? Hey, let's ask Jesus. You want to? When this woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed, Jesus got in her face and he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And that is what this little nobody teenager did back in first century Nazareth when she heard the annunciation of Gabriel. Look what Mary said. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. 
Let it be to me according to your word. God uses ordinary people to do great things. And don't you ever forget it. I'm going to close with a story that uh, I have had this in my illustration file for probably 20 years. I've probably shared it here over the years. I don't remember. But it, uh, I can't let go of this because it is so Jesus and it is so gospel and it is so appropriate to the message this morning that God has not given up, God will come through, and that we can be part of God's great plan no matter who we are. This is a middle-aged lady writing about her family. Here's what she says. Uh, she's talking about another lady now. She says she was a modest, soft-spoken woman, trim, quiet, and unassuming. She was not the type one particularly noticed, among others in the crowd. This woman's modest Oregon home was just like her, trim, quiet, and unassuming. It was not the type one particularly noticed, among others on the street, ordinary. She often felt worthless and told her pastor, everybody else at church seems to have some special talent, but I just don't have any ministry at all. Over in Papua New Guinea, below the equator and half a world away, a tanned, blonde missionary towered above dark-skinned indigenous villagers often stooping to enter their grass-thatched huts. Sometimes he trekked with them down a jungle trail. Sometimes he piloted his helicopter to take them out to a doctor or bring them supplies. Sometimes he flew over almost impenetrable terrain to transport translators working to bring God's word into the languages of that area's people. The young pilot loved his life and ministry. One day, a friend asked him, how did you happen to become a, a missionary? And here's what he said. He said, well, my brother and I were going around our neighborhood one Halloween night when a neighbor dropped an invitation to attend Sunday school into our trick-or-treat bags. That's when what started mom and dad and my little brother and me going to a Bible-believing church. Well, what happened to the other three people in your family? My brother's the head of his church's Sunday school program. Mom writes articles for Christian publications. Dad directs the church choir and other activities. His friend was awed and silent for several seconds before saying, and all this resulted from a simple invitation to Sunday school dropped into your trick-or-treat bag. Back in her home in Oregon, the modest, soft-spoken woman still felt worthless because she had no ministry at all. I don't know why God didn't give me some special talent, she said to herself. I don't teach. I can't play the piano. I'm not young enough to go out as a missionary. The quiet woman was right. She didn't teach. She didn't play the piano. She was unable to go out as a missionary. She was ordinary. About all she'd ever done was drop an invitation to Sunday school into two little neighbor boys' Halloween bags. And then the author writes, I can attest that the above story is true. You see, I was that modest, soft-spoken woman's neighbor. And that missionary in Papua New Guinea is my son. Wow. So when you go from this place and you get out into the real world, you know, uh, it's important that Jesus is sinless. It's important that he's fully God. But uh, what do you do with that on Thursday? What's important here in our text is that God has not given up. And God is at work in your world and my world and that he is ready to use the most ordinary among us and the smallest acts of grace in the name of Jesus to change lives for him. That's the message of, Christ of Christmas, folks. Let's pray.